Uh, good evening, ladies and gentlemen. I'm uh, Dr. Sajit Edir Singer, Secretary, uh, Sri Lanka Medical Association. So to conduct this session uh, today, uh, Professor Indi Karunathilika uh, will be moderating uh, this session. Uh, and uh, Dr. Ananda Vijayavikrama, consultant physician from uh, Infectious Disease Hospital, and uh, doc, uh, Dr. Viraj, uh, consultant pediatrician uh, from Ledridge Hospital, will be joining as the resource paper persons. And uh, we will wait for another five minutes uh, for people to join. And after that, uh, Dr. Indika will uh, start with the moderation. Good evening, everyone. So uh, on behalf of uh, Sri Lanka Medical Association and SLMA 247 Doc Call Service, I welcome all of you for this very important webinar. Today, we will be discussing about identification of common flu-like illnesses. It's a very important topic uh, in this situation because at the moment, uh, there are a lot of uh, flu-like illnesses spread in very fast. The influenza is there and the season the, has come and the number of patients are increasing. At the same time, the COVID also hasn't left us. It's also there. And similarly, we should be able to differentiate between other very important illnesses such as dengue and so on and so forth. So therefore, today we have invited two very important resource persons. And Dr. Ananda Vijay Vikrama, uh, who is a consultant physician of the National Hospital of Infectious Diseases. And I don't think he needs uh, any further introduction regarding his contribution and his experience regarding this area. And he's also the president in SLMA as well. So what we thought is, uh, in addition to Dr. Ananda, we have Dr. Viraj Jai Singh because uh, management of flu-like illnesses for small children is also very important, especially for the 247 volunteers who might be called upon to answer such calls. This knowledge would be very important. So I request all of you to make the maximum use of this very important webinar and also to contribute to the SLMA 247 service. So without further ado, we'll start the discussion. What we thought is that we'll get both uh, resource persons to discuss. So I invite Dr. Anandavi J. Vikram to start, and then Dr. Viraj also can contribute according to the common presentations, how we can identify, how we can differentiate, and the basic management at the primary level. Uh, over to you, Dr. Anandavi J. Vikram. Uh, thank you very much, Dr. Uh, Karnatilka, and uh, I would like to thank the uh, SLMA for oh, organizing this uh, same webinar, uh, because as uh, Professor Indika mentioned, this is a very um, important uh, topic uh, or presentation. At, at present, in the present context, we see uh, quite a lot of patients coming with the flu-like illnesses, uh, or shall we say fevers, uh, and uh, it is important to uh, decide how to give treatment to them at uh, primary care, and also when they when to decide when they need admission and uh, and once admitted what are the and even before admission what are the possible differential diagnosis and accordingly how uh, they should be investigated and treated uh, uh, as uh, already mentioned we see quite a lot of patients with influenza at the moment and then uh, there's, uh, there's some increase in, in the incidence of COVID-19 also, even though we do uh, less testing, much less testing at present. Uh, we see patients, but from the amount of testing and the positivity rate, I think the numbers are uh, higher than a uh, couple of months ago, but it's not very high. And then we see a lot of dengue patients, uh, it's of course increasing and in the, in the coming months with the monsoon rains, we expect a, a much higher number of uh, dengue patients. Uh, and also uh, similarly with the rain season, we see increasing number of uh, leptospirosis. And probably in addition to this, some other viral uh, infections, especially causing respiratory symptoms are uh, going on at present. Uh, this is what uh, the, the common presentations we see in uh, adults at present. Go ahead. 
thank you dr anand uh, shall we get uh, dr viraj's inputs as well now dr anand mentioned about the common presentations related to adults and uh, that uh, the clinicians have noticed an increase in incidence so dr viraj what's your experience uh, is, uh, no, because, uh, thank you very much uh, for the opportunity given so uh, as uh, dr anand vijay vikram mentioned so we saw a very sharp rise in number of uh, patients presenting with fever at lr it's actually numbers had like almost tripled uh, especially with respiratory symptoms as well and uh, so whenever possible like whenever needed we had uh, done some of uh, swabbing and then we found that uh, influenza ever is fever response for most of the cases as well as some influenza b as well and at the same time uh, even though coming with respiratory symptoms sometimes uh children coming with dengue also has shown a like a quite a steep rise so because in sri lanka even though they having a respiratory infection doesn't give any protection against dengue so in an endemic country in a dengue endemic country so having a cough or cold a child could be incubating a dengue infection as well so uh, i think um, so likewise as dr anand vich vijay vikram mentioned we had seen a, quite a, a sharp rise in dengue cases as well Uh, and of course uh, the common cold uh, infections like uh, say probably with we haven't done any virological testing though but probably with uh, respiratory sensitive virus uh, because we see a lot of bronchiolitis babies coming who require a lot of uh, high flow and icu care uh, and again uh, some viral pneumonia as well so uh, so the common cold viruses also have uh, gone up and a lot of opd admissions these days even though not presenting much with fever but with a lot of respiratory symptoms and then uh, 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 one or two patients with leptospirosis as well not so co- common as in adults i guess uh, but uh, yet again uh, i think uh, down south of course i think uh, around kaluthur area banadur uh, area and um, uh, lpta balapitya those areas i think it's a bit more common eh? but uh, again uh, we had few patients with leptospirosis as well and uh, then um, then there was a slight increase in the number of uh, hand foot mouth disease in the past uh, one or two months that of course uh, have gone down uh, uh, covid 19 again we don't do routine testing but then uh, i i assume that a uh, lot of covid 19 is also going around uh, but i think whenever needed when we tested there were one or two patients who got tested positive Uh, but then again it's the same sort of pattern that we uh, see in children similar to what uh, dr anand vijay kumar had mentioned earlier and uh, then the other thing is like uh, we saw one or two patients coming with fever respiratory symptoms later coming with uh, continuous convulsions and all that also with probably we thought some of them had influenza positive so that again had uh, given rise to some complications as well so the pattern is somewhat similar and uh, cases Uh, keep rising until date uh what do you adopt in the yeah thank you dr viraj yes and now uh, both of you have mentioned uh, a rapid increase in the number of cases yeah so uh, i would like to ask from both of you maybe it start with dr anand vijay vikram uh, now what what could be the possible ca- uh, causes i mean uh, you also mentioned uh, possibilities uh, what are the what are the possible reasons for this sharp rise is it the seasonal is it due to the weather or is it a combination or is it due to a strain uh, rapidly spreading or is it due to like the the public behavior so what 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 do you think what are the reasons uh, for this sharp increase during this period uh yes in the i think the reasons are multiple uh, as you suggested uh, one thing is uh, the with uh, with the, the see, we see a seasonal pattern with dengue influenza leptospirosis uh, those things and uh, and the uh, the coming months the june uh, july those months are actually the we see increasing numbers of this generally so that is uh, one reason with the monsoons coming in and also the the far paddy uh, farming uh, going on uh, these are common uh, issues at the uh, common issues uh, however we have been seeing this increasing numbers of uh, dengue cases since uh, latter part of february uh, the case numbers are unusually high for that period of the year for february march 
April period, generally we don't see uh, a lot of dengue patients, even though we see dengue patients. Uh, the numbers uh, actually uh, almost double that of last year. And also uh, the entomological studies have shown that the, uh, the density of uh, the mosquitoes were high and uh, therefore the Brito index was high. Uh, so therefore it, it was predicted that the numbers will further go up and which we see at, at present. Uh, so the, the number of dengue cases are unusually high for this year compared to last two or three years. Uh, so we might, it is possible that we might get more numbers because uh, still I understand now the day before yesterday I inquired from the, the entomological team uh, from, of Columbia District and they said that still the, the Brito index is quite high around 30, 40 at, uh, in some many places. Uh, so that shows uh, that there's a high chance of uh, having higher numbers uh, during the coming weeks. Uh, and uh, the respiratory symptoms, uh, viruses are, as uh, Viraj mentions, we, it's, uh, it's also common. And uh, another important thing, which I want, I also want to stress, which Viraj mentioned, is patients coming with respiratory symptoms, and some of them have dengue. Uh, of course, uh, some people come with sore throat, which is not, not that uncommon symptom, but uh, having co-infection uh, is also there. So one has to uh, think of this possible, uh, knowing what is prevalent at present, one has to suspect these illnesses when somebody comes with uh, fever uh, in, in, the, in the present context. Uh, and uh, of course, COVID, uh, as uh, Viraj also mentioned that we don't uh, check much, but uh, uh, the, the impression we get is the strain which is going around is not uh, that uh, virulent. Uh, so we don't see severe illnesses un except in, uh, in uh, immunocompromised people. Uh, but nevertheless, we have to consider that uh, when necessary. So, uh, uh, we have a couple of infections, a couple of etiological reasons going around, and one has to consider these things when encountered with these patients. Oh. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Ananda. Uh, Dr. Viraj, uh, would you like to add from your perspective? Uh, yes, Dr. Indigat. Uh, so, uh, actually, uh, now, so, uh, probably for the increase in rise of uh, uh, dengue as well as influenza cases in uh, in the in the childhood population would be I think it's again multifactorial as Sanamza mentioned. So uh, if we like uh, because children had been away from school for so many years because of COVID uh, and generally it's like you know uh, the preschoolers and probably the grade one children who uh, develop these infections like very rapidly and then they develop immunity and they go to grade two or grade three by that time. They would have, have they would have some sort of a immunity against respiratory viruses. But now what has happened is like uh, consecutively one to two years, children had been at home away from infections. So probably their immune system hasn't learned to fight this infection. So all of a sudden, about three batches of children go to school and they are all of a sudden in, in exposed to a lot of infections. And whereas uh, this would happen like every year, and we see only a batch of belonging to just one year, whereas here we see children belonging to about two to three years, uh, two to three batches, uh, who are who have not previously been exposed to respiratory viruses. So probably we are like, you know, the number has tripled maybe. So that may be one of the reasons why we see a lot of children coming with respiratory, increased number of respiratory infections and influenza like illnesses. And also the other thing is, I think uh, during COVID time, children had been at home. And uh, so they are the, the, uh, they didn't go to school. So while at home, obviously, parents uh, try to uh, make sure that children are not bitten by many mosquitoes. Whereas now they are at the peak biting times, children are at school. So unless I think we uh, like uh, give good attention to uh, keeping the school environments uh, quite clean, uh, children, children are invariably going to be bitten by uh, mosquitoes. So which uh, will uh, in turn cause a rise in uh, number of dengue cases. Uh, so I think uh, 
So those are the, uh, the, the the main reasons why I see that the infections have gone. Of course, the monsoons and so generally in children also this uh, the trend is generally uh, when the monsoon start the infections go up by around August only the the number of infections come down generally uh, during the August school holidays only it sort of comes down. So probably uh, it's uh, following that pattern as well. And um, then again the other thing is um, I mean parents uh, sending children to school with probably with mild fever and respiratory symptoms and our classrooms are jam-packed and uh, these very contagious viruses probably go around in classrooms. So because now towards the end of the, the school holidays, we saw a slight decrease in the number of respiratory cases coming to us. But now again, I think from tomorrow, once the school starts, it will slowly go up. Uh, so I, I feel uh, it's multifactorial, but uh, apart from what uh, Anand Vijay Kamisa mentioned, I think these are some of the other additional things I could tell about children. Yeah, and then these children take this home and then others yes. get <laughs> infected. Yeah, that's what, that's what happens, sir. Now, over to you, Dr. Indigar. Thank you very much, Dr. Viraj. I think very, very important, very interesting observations that you have made. And uh, I mean, uh, regarding the possible the increase in number of cases and, and the observation that you have made, especially regarding uh, the uh, school children coming to the school and they being exposed to. Right. So those are simple measures that we can do because whatever it is, whatever the cause for the increase in number, the most important that we can do is to take the measures the simple measure that we can take to prevent, isn't it? I mean, uh, the prevent the infection and uh, so like the clean in the environment and uh, repellent so on and so forth. Uh, so based on your observations, those would be very useful. Yeah. And uh, now uh, I would like to move on to the the primary care aspect because there may be a lot of patients coming at primary care level and also for the two four seven volunteers also there may be calls regarding adults and children presenting with fever so what are your advices to them uh, when do what are the measures that what are the advices that you would give, uh, give them the, the doctors and also uh, when should they what are the red flags that they should be alerted and what are the actions that they need to take and how can they refer at what point what are the investigations uh, so what are what are your advices to the doctors i think this part would be very useful for the participants Maybe you we'll start with Dr. Ananda Vijay Vikrama. So what are, what are your advices uh, to the doctors at the first contact level, uh, regardless whether they are at the primary care level uh, or maybe at the GP practice or maybe the two for seven volunteers? Yeah, I think uh, I think one of the biggest concern of uh, patients, especially when uh, teenagers, young adults get affected, is the, is the high fever. Many of these patients come with high fevers. And uh, sometimes uh, the parents or the spouse uh, get very concerned because the fever doesn't settle at times with the paracetamol, probably with all the all these infections we mentioned. Uh, and uh, so the uh, for generally for adults, these respiratory infections do not cause uh, complications generally, unless they have some other uh, immunosuppression like. Uh, chronic renal disease or patients who had transplants and such patients. Uh, however, uh, it is important to monitor them. And another important thing, as already mentioned, these patients are sometimes the dengue patients also can come with uh, these respiratory symptoms, either due to co-infection or, or due to primarily as a symptom. Uh, and uh, also uh, because of the prevalence, high prevalence at present, and the, the possibility of increasing numbers in coming weeks. Uh, I think in any fever patients at present, uh, uh, any fever patients, an adult coming with fever, uh, one has to consider the possibility of dengue, even though sometimes it may be other, other uh, viral infection like, uh, like uh, COVID or influenza or other, other respiratory viral infection. And um, so therefore it is important in the primary care to advise them uh, properly. Uh, one thing is not to get panic because of high fever and not to give anything other than paracetamol for the fever. Uh, we can give paracetamol and four day in combination, but uh, nothing else, not uh, NSAs, not steroids, definitely. 
because in case if it is dengue, those can cause problems. Even if it is not dengue, even in influenza or COVID, uh, the steroids and NSAIDs uh, should not be given. So basically at present for, uh, for any patient who is coming with fever, uh, whether it is, uh, whether you suspect uh, influenza, the viral infection, COVID or dengue, one should not give uh, NSAIDs uh, and similarly steroids. So I think that is one important thing. We see quite a number of patients who had been treated with NSAIDs and or steroids or both sometimes coming, getting admitted to hospitals uh, and they, they, many of them develop complications. In fact, uh, last, uh, I think it was six months ago, one patient died. Uh, and then uh, I think the relatives uh, went in search of the general practitioner and, uh, and threatened that there was some commotion uh, because the general practitioner has given in the sense to this lady, it's a young, young lady who died of that, died of bleeding. She had dengue. Uh, so it should not be given. And uh, the one reason is I think a lot of doctors are aware that this should not be given, but uh, uh, we, they give it because it causes symptomatic relief. Uh, it's true that uh, not all patients get complications, but I don't think anybody should take a risk as a doctor. This is a risk giving these things. So don't take that risk as a doctor because you might get repercussions if you if the patient get complications. Um, in fact, there is a circular by the ministry also not to use these drugs. So it is important that these uh, should not be given. So basically, uh, at, uh, on admission, on, on, uh, on presentation during the initial period, they, they basically need symptomatic treatment, uh, paracetamol for the fever, and then uh, an antimatic if a lot of people have no CR vomiting, uh, so they need an antibiotic, maybe a, maybe a, some antacid or H2 receptor blocker. And if they have respiratory symptoms, uh, then uh, the simple bronchodilator uh, and, and an antihistamine at times will be helpful. I don't think they need anything. Most of these patients need anything more than that. If there is a suggestion of a bacterial infection by causing uh, respiratory illness, then start on antibiotics, but uh, initially most of the cases which comes at present do not need antibiotics. Uh, so again, we see uh, use of antibiotics quite commonly and which should not be done. Even, even doctors self-treat themselves when they get these uh, viral infections uh, with infections, uh, with antibiotics. Uh, maybe as a sort of a defensive method, but I don't think that should, that should be done because then uh, we, later when they get secondary bacterial infection, this is not uncommon in these viral infections, they don't respond to common antibiotics. So that's a common problem we see. And uh, sometimes uh, they come to us after going to uh, many uh, general practitioners uh, two, three times to uh, seeking medical care. Uh, they had two, three causes of antibiotics when they come after about uh, 10 days or two weeks. So initial use of antibiotics should be very judiciously done. Uh, and most of the time it is not necessary. And other important thing which uh, we have to do is to do a full blood count at the end of 48 hours uh, when they come to uh, from the beginning of the fever. Uh, again, main thing is suspecting a dengue. Uh, one may do a C-reactive protein also in adults, which gives a reasonable uh, level of, uh, we can have a reasonable level of suspicion if it is, if it is very high, uh, if it is say, saying that it is possibly a bacterial infection. Uh, in dengue, in uh, influenza, uh, it uh, can go up to maybe 30s, uh, 20s, 30s, but uh, generally it's not very high. Of course, in COVID, sometimes it can be quite high but uh, not in other viral infections. So if it is very high, 80s, 100s, then uh, you may suspect a bacterial infection going on. Uh, other than that, uh, what is the other, other important thing is that these patients needs to be, needs to have physical rest. That is important because sometimes they go to work, especially we see adults uh, coming late to hospitals. Uh, maybe they bring children early because uh, they're worried when the child is ill. 
So, uh, but uh, unlike that, uh, the adults keep on going to work. They look after their children. They have other problems at home to sort out. So they don't get enough physical rest. And also they don't uh, uh, come for medical care uh, early enough. Uh, and other thing is sometimes um, they get treatment during the initial one or two days. And then when they feel better, they basically relax and they don't come for follow-up. You see many patients who were asked to come on day three with a full blood count, haven't done a full blood count because they feel be they say they feel better. So they don't come to the, uh, the general practitioner uh, for the follow-up. I think it is important to stress about the, the follow-up of these patients, uh, even if they feel better, because otherwise by day five or uh, four or five, they can feel uh, bad and, uh, bad with complications. Uh, another important thing which is uh, necessary is to have uh, adequate hydration uh, because otherwise dehydration can to cause uh, uh, increased severity of increase in severity of symptoms. Uh, occasionally we have seen in adults, I don't know whether this is common in children, or you see this in children also, uh, patients coming with uh, quite a significant uh, diarrhea. Uh, some viral infections and even in dengue. Uh, some patients quite, uh, some patients come actually get admitted in shock due to dehydration, due to caused by uh, diarrhea. So that is one thing you have to keep in mind because uh, again, it's important to maintain the adequate hydration in, in these patients. Uh, so I think these are some of my thoughts uh, which can be important in the initial presentation of this patient. To, uh, to the primary care physician. Oh. Thank you, Dr. Anandavichai Vikram, because uh, you have actually provided in a very simple way the important areas, uh, especially to have uh, the need to have very high alert on the dengue and also the need to avoid uh, the steroids and NSAIDs and similarly the antibiotic abuse. Actually, all these things are what we have noticed but we are noticed during the COVID time also, during 247 service also, there were several instances we have noticed such instances. Similarly, we have highlighted the need for a good rest. And uh, again, uh, something that uh, that was very much highlighted during the COVID time also for rest, for good recovery, and also to reduce the complications. So very important, very simple messages, but very important. Uh, so. Uh, yeah, can we add from Dr. Viraj? Uh, uh, yes, Dr. Indira. Uh, so uh, basically, uh, as Anandavi uh, Vikram said, uh, so our, like when a child presents with uh, a fever, so uh, in Sri Lanka, actually one of the most important things that you need to pick up early would be a dinghy, that we should not miss that. So again, we have to highlight that. And uh, the thing, of course, if it's influenza, there are certain comorbid conditions that could cause a severe disease. So whether like you know whether it's just a common uh, viral viral fever or is it something like a dengue or is it something like uh, influenza or is it something like leptospirosis or are there any features of sepsis maybe in a very severely ill child. So those are the things that uh, go through our mind. And then again, um, especially babies under one year uh, with these virals, they, they start with a call, like a very, very mild cold or a cough and then they could develop into a bronchiolitis. So that sort of patient also should be picked up early. So those are our concerns. So, so basically, uh, when a child comes uh, to us with fever, so the first thing would be again um, to see whether there are any, uh, any, any red flags. So we'll discuss about red flags a bit later. Uh, but otherwise, of course, uh, I mean, if, uh, if it's like a viral infection, what we always say is, again, as uh, Anand Dilipon said, we will not uh, like we'll uh, thoroughly discourage uh, doctors from using steroids because even for small babies we had seen they had been on dex dexamethasone or something like that for symptomatic relief and then uh, they are given in SAIDs because uh, of very high fever and some had been given uh, like almost double dose of paracetamol that again is a problem in children because it's all uh, the dose is generally 15 milligram per kilogram so some per dose so that again six hours. 
so if uh, so for some babies you can't for small kids you can't uh, you might not be able to break the paracetamol tablet in such a way that you give the exact amount so sometimes they just give half tablet uh, but actually the the necessity is much less than that so uh, we had seen cases of paracetamol overdose like that as well so which could be catastrophic so again we'll have to stick to the proper dose and no nsaids please and no steroids and then again so now if in the initial first two days we don't do blood tests so uh, providing them with good hydration is very important because if it turns out to be a dengue uh, if the patient is all in dehydrated and by the time we do the full blood count at 48 hours and if we pick up that okay it's a, a dengue infection and child is already dehydrated for so they could go into shock quite easily so it's very important that we uh, calculate the amount of fluids that they need so generally we go by uh, this holiday formula where for the first 100 uh, 10 kilos we give 100 ml per kilo and for the next uh, uh, 10 kilos we give 20 ml per kilo and uh, so afterwards uh, per kilo we give additional 20 ml per kg so like that up to about uh, so you will have to calculate the 24 hour requirement and then divide it by 25 and give them an overall fluid target which should be very helpful whether it's a viral infection whether it's a just a simple viral infection or influenza or whether it's a dengue. So hydration is very important in small babies because they could get dehydrated very easily. And then, and then of course, to tell about the red flags, which we'll discuss. And then, um, uh, uh, then so in the initial, uh, uh, at the onset, I mean, if there's a child is well and no red flags, and uh, I mean, of, of course, we are not going to do a, a full blood count um, in the first 24 to 48 hours. So what we should uh, tell them is, okay, good rest and then uh, give paracetamol and nothing else and good nutrition and uh, like and rest in the sense sometimes parents tend to send these children to school, which is not uh, advisable. So if they have fever and significant respiratory symptoms, they should stay at home. And uh, then of course, if uh, we think that, I mean, and then again, having respiratory symptoms will not rule out the possibility of dengue. And then, uh, and then there are certain symptoms that would favor more of influenza rather than a common cold. So what they say is if uh, myalgia, fatigue, body aches are more common uh, and high fever is there, so it's more likely to be an influenza infection rather than a common cold. So then again, because uh, then you could critically think that, okay, it's more likely to be an influenza rather than a common cold right so because common cold of course i mean with just symptomatic management they are going to be okay but then again having this fever so if it's an influenza again we have to be a bit careful because just to ask for history of, for any comorbid conditions because if comorbidities like congenital heart then uh, chronic lung diseases liver disorders or some immunosuppression is there then again there is a place for antivirals uh, in children uh, if they are having influenza uh, right. Uh, so, but then if it's a common cold, of course, you're going to wait and see. Uh, then again, so the most important thing is at 48 hours, we do a full blood count and then uh, uh, we uh, make sure uh, we will just try to look for features of dengue, look for leukopenia and a thrombocytopenia. Right. And then, um, uh, of course, they are there, then the management would be uh, different. And uh, then if it's like, okay, the fever is still ongoing and high fever is there, features are more of more, more, more likely to be influenza, then you have to uh, look at these comorbidities. And again, if the child is below two years, again, there is a place for uh, starting ostalmavir. So those are the, the things that you need to consider when looking at this child. Uh, and then the red flags, if you are thinking about influenza, would be uh, if the baby is below three months, and has fever, then again, that's a red flag. And then if there's some amount of respiratory distress or a tachypnea, and then feeding difficulties are there, and a child hasn't passed urine within six hours, uh, for the past six hours, or uh, a child has a comorbid condition, and it's getting worse. Let's say he has asthma, and now you see that the child is uh, having uh, increased difficulty in breathing. So that again is a red flag. And then again, having seizures or having drowsiness, child is quite drowsy and uh, not arousable. And then um, if the child complains of chest pain or something like it, could be developing a pneumonia. 
or else now at the at the onset of the uh, the infection now the fever seems to have been settling down but then again he starts getting secondary fever spike so could be having a secondary bacterial infection right so that again is a red flag so if these features that these are some of the red flags right then again for dengue again there are different ones like they tend they probably all those things and then again if the child is dehydrated right and then the mother is worried about the baby so it's uh, with these uh, conditions it's a red flag and child should be immediately brought to a hospital to be seen by a uh, healthcare provider so uh, so those are the red flags to be worried about and as the vijay kumar mentioned earlier that adults are getting late to come so we had seen that even children are like that now i don't know because of transportation difficulties or something like that or because of their financial issues we see quite a lot of children coming quite late to the hospital now um, and we had like one or two cardiac arrest also on admission so uh, so it's very important uh, to mention about these red flags and if there are any sinister you know signs that you, that worry you okay that child is very dehydrated no urine output drowsy distress or very high fever like say 104 degrees fever and not coming down with paracetamol so better to advise them to go to hospital uh, because of this i think mean, with this background of financial difficulties and all people are tending to wait till the last as sir mentioned the most important would be doing a full blood count for 8 hours and then if there's obstructive fever probably follow it up probably repeat full blood counts and see with to see whether the platelets are coming down or not and then hydration only paracetamol no nsaids and no steroids and no unnecessary antibiotics uh, because that could complicate the whole course um, and then again a crp also would be helpful because sometimes we had seen seedling very well children having secondary bacterial infections after influenza so if the crp is uh, going up as i as uh, sir mentioned again crp is of 20 30 we could uh, possibly assume it could be due to a the same viral infection because of the inflammatory process uh, but uh, if it's higher than that then one has to consider antibiotics or come getting the patient down to hospital or ane uh, to look for a active focus uh, i think uh, that's what i would like to highlight over to you dr indira yeah and dr viraj thank you very much because you have highlighted and very clearly presented what are the red flags that should alert the doctors and also the, the parents and uh, also not to take chances when there is slightest suspicion so you have provided very comprehensive input about uh, the red flags that are present yeah uh, dr anand vijay vikram would you like to add to what uh, uh, dr viraj mentioned uh yeah actually my, what uh, dr viraj mentioned regarding children most of the things are applicable to uh, adults also uh, and uh, um only the, the only difference probably is, uh, it's easy to calculate the fluid uh, regime for adults it, at uh, at home because generally for an average adult we give her to about 2 and 1/2 liters for 24 hours Uh, so we we don't have to calculate we calculate it for 50 kilos uh, even if the weight is uh, higher than that so it is easy to uh, calculate rather than in the case of a child uh, and uh, that again we uh, advise people to take uh, fluid um, with uh, solutes like uh, king coconut water then uh, or uh, then things like lime juice uh, jeevani uh, kanji Uh, so those are those are better than plain water not that they can't take plain water but uh, we have to encourage people taking uh, fluid with more, more solutes and uh, and of course a lot of people can't eat uh, we we one thing we see especially when uh, uh, teenagers come is the mothers force them to eat and uh, then they eat and vomit uh, so you have to tell the, the parents especially and sometimes the the, the spouses that uh, they cannot if they can't eat it's not it's all right not to eat but the important thing is to uh, take liquids and maintain the hydration and uh, that again it's not essential to have this every hour uh, because sometimes we see that the patients are advised to have uh, fluid every hour so that they don't get any sleep they are woken up in the night also to take uh, fluid which is not necessary they can have that uh, amount uh, spread across the day 
uh, when they have, when they get admitted, it's different. When they are looking for complications or when they get complications, it's, it's different. But other than otherwise, uh, if they have adequate amount of hydration during the daytime, they can have good uh, six, seven hours sleep. Uh, so it is uh, you can spread the uh, fluid across the, the daytime, uh, giving two and a half liters for an adult and then the calculated amount for a child. And uh, then uh, uh, it is uh, it is not essential to measure, measure the amount of urine they pass, but uh, as Dr. Vidak said, if they don't pass urine for six hours, then that can be a problem. So it's better to bring them to hospital when that happens even, even for adults. And uh, of course the adults can have some idea about their urine output, even without measuring. So if they see that it is gradually getting reduced, then also that uh, that also should be brought to the notice of uh, of a doctor, or maybe they should come to hospital if they uh, develop that. Um, and when it comes to dengue, uh, the, the the red flags I believe everyone knows now: uh, the tender hepatomegaly, uh, repeated vomiting. Uh, and uh, repeated uh, if they have severe diarrhea and uh, then uh, uh, of, of course if you can measure the heart rate uh, or the blood pressure if the heart rate is quite high disproportionately high for fever uh, or if the blood pressure is low so those are those are important things uh, for them to uh, come to hospital uh, another problem we see uh, especially uh, may be common to both adults and children is uh, that uh, the in the primary care the primary care physician advised the patients to get a blood count done but when the blood is given the sometimes the report is available maybe 12 hours or, or sometimes 24 hours later so that is not satisfactory one has to make sure i think as primary care physicians uh, or uh, doctors working in OPD setup, one uh, has to make sure that the report will be available within a couple of hours. Uh, I still remember the, the probably the most unfortunate case I have seen uh, of a child who was brought to the brought to a private sector one evening, a 16, 17 year old child brought to hospital in, in toolbone shock. Uh, what has happened was the, uh, the primary care physician has advised them to get a blood count done on the previous day. And it was done in the evening. Report was available next day morning. The father to collect the report, didn't realize the, the problem in that, went to work and came back in the evening home. And then saw that the child is very unwell and brought to the hospital was when the child was brought to the hospital, it was in full burn shock and three hours later the child died. Uh, so that sort of thing can happen and we still see patients coming like that uh, with the report done 12 hours, even sometimes 20 hours before uh, and they come with complications. So one has to make sure that if you ask for a blood count, make sure that you see that or even if you can't see uh, Sometimes you work in the in the evening, so you may not be able to see the patient in the morning. But give them advice. The, most of them know uh, when you explain when the platelet counts are this low. Generally, when the platelet count is goes below 130 or so, we advise them to get admitted if you suspect dengue. Even even in uh, other cases, I think it is important to admit them when the platelet count goes below or uh, around 130, 140. Uh, because uh, there can be co-infections. Even the patients are having respiratory tract infections. Sometimes in respiratory tract viral infections, even in influenza or COVID, the platelet count tend to drop. But uh, rather than taking a risk, if it is dropping, better to admit because in case if it's dengue, they can get um, complications when it goes uh, further down. Um, oh. Again, uh, thank you, Dr. Arand. Very, very important information and also uh, the, the importance of the early detection and to have a high alert. So very important areas. And the case that you have highlighted really, uh, really illustrate the need to have a high degree of suspicion and also, I mean, uh, not to ignore any uh, sinister situation. So I mean, very, very important for all of us to learn from that. And uh, the, the participants are welcome to come with their questions so, uh, in, the, in the chat. 
and uh, most of the questions actually both of you have uh, answered for example the other questions about the fluid management at home and do adults uh, need to measure fluid at home those questions both of you have answered in your uh, in your present uh, in your the explanation so uh, probably there's no need to go into that there's one question regarding preventive measures since prevention is very important and uh, so what are the general preventive measures that you can take related to flu like illnesses so specific ones related to covid and then maybe dengue so what are your advices related to the prevent preventive measures a question coming from the chat Yeah, I think preventive measures are very important because uh, most of the time now, this uh, when it comes to both uh, when it comes to dengue and other respiratory viruses, the preventive measures are important. Uh, we know dengue patients, uh, dengue mosquito is a, it's a generally a day biter, uh, and it uh, the breeding places are mostly in, in the in your surrounding areas. Uh, so it is important to look for such places and, and clean such places. And sometimes uh, the place may be something which you generally do not think of, uh, like uh, an unused uh, toilet, unused commode of a toilet, uh, where you might not look at, uh, or, or, or a flower vase with, uh, with uh, water. Uh, so one has to look for places and and uh, of breeding and uh, discard such places. Uh, uh, we see patients coming in, in families get affected. So obviously the, the mosquitoes in such instances are mostly more likely uh, in the, within the house or in the in your premises. Uh, so it is important to clean your premises. Of course, the, there are limitations where you one has to. Uh, especially when the house, other houses are also closed by their limitations. However, I think whatever you can, we should do. And uh, then when it comes to uh, uh, the respiratory illnesses, uh, these viruses tend to spread very quickly and easily, the respiratory viruses, what we have at the moment. Uh, so one has to probably, and, and uh, we see children bringing it from schools, and then the, the people uh, at home get infected. Uh, so one has to be uh, especially concerned if you have very old people at home, uh, grandmothers at home, or, uh, and also if patients with other illnesses, especially immunosuppressive illnesses uh, are at home, they have to take necessary respiratory preventive measures at home also to uh, prevent from getting these infections. Uh, so I think the preventive uh, methods are very important, and especially with the ongoing rain, the water gets easily collected and uh, in places where we generally don't think of. Um, uh, so it is important to get the, the premises clean, uh, the house and other surrounding area is clean. Uh, and uh, then uh, there's a question on dengue antigen, if I may answer that also at uh, the, the person. Uh, and dengue antigen uh, is a useful test. However, the negative antigen test does not exclude dengue. Uh, the positivity rate varies from uh, during the duration. The chances, if you are doing the antigen, do it during the first three days of fever. After that, the sensitivity is very low, goes uh, quite low down. But even within during first three days, the sensitivity can vary from uh, 90 to uh, 60 percent or so. So the, if it is positive, we take it as a positive or dengue positive case. But if it is negative, uh, do not exclude dengue and continue to do repeat, uh, monitor the patient with uh, repeated blood counts because we take decisions based on the blood count and other, other clinical features of the patient. Uh, and then in some cases, there's a question regarding uh, ITP patient. Uh, so their platelets are anyway low and uh, any, any, any viral infections, their platelet will go down. We see similar patients with uh, patient, patients having uh, chronic liver disease, especially cirrhosis. So in such instances, we have to have a low threshold to admit these patients. We don't wait. Uh, we can't have sort of uh, uh, 
definite uh, cutoff points to admit these patients. So if it is low, you admit even on the day, even on day one or two, better admit these patients uh, because they need to be monitored uh, regularly. Similarly, the pregnant mothers need to be admitted uh, in uh, as early as possible because they tend to develop uh, complications more frequently and also they tend to develop complications early, not after the total count of 100,000. So we need to admit them uh, much early. And then other patients with uh, who are having immunosuppressants like uh, uh, renal transplant or um, chemotherapy for malignancies, so such patients also needs to be admitted early. Uh, yeah, um, so... Yes, uh, I think you have answered more than most of the yes, questions. Yeah. Oh, oh. Regarding a low platelet count with NS1 antigen, but that also I think you have answered in your in your response. Yes. So the the, the main area that you have highlighted about high risk groups like the pregnant, immunosuppressed, elderly, so on and so forth. So we need to be extra cautious. One, one question related to COVID. Uh, what is your suggestion regarding the COVID prevention? Um, I think uh, uh, both COVID and uh, even influenza can sometimes, uh, influenza also can time, at times can lead to complications in adults. Uh, I'm not sure how common it is in children, but uh, in adults it's not very common, but we see patients sometimes developing severe bronchopneumonia with influenza. So those are patients with uh, other risk factors like uh, severe uncontrolled diabetes or immunosuppressants. So such patients should, uh, one firstly, they should try to take measures to get them, prevent get, uh, from getting themselves infected, like using face masks. If somebody in the family is having uh, an infection and also prevent, uh, avoid uh, uh, close contacts with them, uh, at least until they get better. Uh, and uh, also, if they get ill, I think it is important to seek medical advice uh, as early as possible. Our best thing is to come to the hospital uh, because uh, Oseltamivaya, which may be necessary in some patients, is not freely available in the private sector. Uh, so best thing is for them to get admitted to hospital if they have uh, worsening symptoms. And also, they need to go by the symptoms if they are respiratory uh, for primary care physicians. One has to assess the their respiratory symptoms, uh, septal rate, uh, and uh, the, the work of breathing. And also one can advise uh, patients to get admitted if they think they become more and more dyslexic. And if they cannot, uh, you can give some rough uh, guidance to get admitted if their respiration uh, is getting worse. Uh, yeah. Yes, uh, yeah, uh, thank you. Uh, so there's another question in the chat, uh, I think for Dr. Viraj, uh, that uh, sometimes children are treated with drugs such as tervutaline syrup, derifiline and theophilines uh, in symptomatic management of influenza. So what are the restrictions and age limits? So what is your opinion and feedback on this? Mm -hmm. uh, like, yeah, uh, so generally, I, it's like this, I mean, uh, even though we use, uh, I mean, we give uh, bronchodilators for off. Um, but in, I mean, when I did my foreign training about within 10 years back, 10, 11 years back, then of course they were like, uh, I don't know, uh, that's what we were also used to. And when we went there, so they won't give bronco I mean, that I also don't practice that, but just to know, just to let you know, so that, uh, you know, they are, they don't give uh, bronco so frequently, unless there is an element of wheezing. So they do a PEFR or they look at, look for bronchi. If they are there, they don't give oral drugs. They only give the salbutamol puff and derifilin and theophilin now out. So just for you to know that that's what they use there. But in Sri Lanka, of course, I mean, you, you most of the patients can't afford a puff and then you can't, you have to uh, ask them to get the space as well. And then uh, so with all that uh, difficulties, uh, we are compelled to give oral uh, bronchodilators like uh, terbutalin or salbutamol or uh, methylsanthine is like theophylin no derivative is of course a trade name so we tend to give those uh, but then again we don't know how effective it is in patients who don't have uh, uh, reactive airways like uh, like a reversible bronchospasm 
but in a, generally in practice we do that at least just thinking that you know it might help because even our parents so compared to uh, people in uk australia our people if they if we don't give them some symptomatic treatment at least they won't be happy so because of that we use it actually even at lrh we use that so terbutaline is not available in the government sector of course it's available in the private sector so for children above six months where we assume that uh, beta receptors uh, are there you, we can use uh, that so the doses of course i think better to refer to uh, uh, formulary uh, drug formulary and just look at it and uh, start and uh, again uh, theophyll in the of course can be used for generally we use it for babies below six months if we think that there is uh, something and then again in bigger children also we can use the limitations would be of course you have to be very careful with uh, methyls and things because the the therapeutic index is very narrow the the toxic dose and the therapeutic dose the the difference is very very less so if you overdose uh, that could you know uh, cause cardiac toxicity supraventricular tachycardia and all so one has to be very careful so generally tend to give a very low dose but of course there is an influenza if you think that the the cough is bad then if you hear some wrong or something yes uh we can use it there is no major restriction but the can then and the the, the certain uh, the, the bnf of course says that you should not use methylsanthines with macrolides because there is a, there are certain drug interactions so but i had seen many people using clarithromycin with their green as well but if you look at the book of course they say not to use both together because uh, macrolides i mean they inhibit i think uh, hepatic liver enzymes so because of that uh, the the methylsanthines are not metabolized properly so when you are using derivatives and the methylsanthines and macrolides together one has to be careful there are certain interactions but other, otherwise of course you you can use it in in influenza there is no hard and fast rule no 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 major limitations provided that you stick to the proper dosage and then other just one more thing which i want to highlight is that as anand vijay prasa mentioned like yesterday we had a patient who came in profound shock Uh, what has happened this patient had gone yesterday early morning to a general practitioner had done a full blood count a full blood count of course shows a platelet count of 110000 but then the parents received the count in, in the evening so probably would have been a very rapid leak i don't know so the the count 110 early morning came to us uh, in profound shock in the evening and platelet count was around uh, 60000 so it had dropped rapidly pc was 54 and pulse was not palpable Uh, but uh, like but we had to give uh, a 20 ml per kg bolus then another 10 ml per kg and dextra and nos but afterwards of course i had to do the patient is stable in the ward but still that happens so we send the full blood count and we don't trace it and we don't tell the importance on the count and parents uh, of course obviously they don't understand the importance of it so they take their own time and get in the report back so it's very important that we highlight and tell them if you send the count please uh, trace it as quickly as possible within maybe 3 4 hours because full blood count doesn't take much time and and get it back to the the medical practitioner at least advise them and of course in children uh, we tend to admit them if the platelet count is below 150 so because i had still seen mo- most of the general practitioners they go by the adult values and sometimes they wait till about even 110 at home and ask them to do a count next day and uh, come a day after so after, so the children child might already be Uh, leaking very much you know and then might come in the peak and in shock so for children if if it's if the platelet count is below 150 it's always advisable to admit them so there may be a lot of unnecessary admissions but that will save uh, the the lives of at least one or two patients which is like you know because if even one child dies we can't forgive ourselves so always just remember that if the platelet count is below 150 admit and then again as i mentioned uh, even in children ors kanji uh king coconut water lime juice solutes are always preferred to plain water and then again just a word about uh, this mask wearing so when uh, children with respiratory symptoms they are not too ill to be kept at home if you are sending a child to school with a mild cold or something maybe but better to encourage them to wear a mask so that he does he she doesn't or he doesn't spread the infection to others and then again if a nursing mother is there i mean uh, she's looking after a, ba- a child with influenza but then she has few more other children at home so if possible uh, this mother could uh, dedicate uh, the father to look after the other two children and probably shift to another room or something and then uh, 
uh, keep the windows open, good ventilation. So mainly it's the droplet precautions and the contact precautions, washing hands properly, wearing a mask, good ventilation. If, if facilities are there to stay in a separate room and then maybe uh, don't, don't uh, share equipment like utensils like cups, spoons and saucers like that, towels, right? If we can do that, we probably could, uh, you know, prevent uh, the infection from spreading. Uh, and then again, dengue, one more thing, apart from what uh, Anandza mentioned was just to make sure that parents are aware uh, that, you know, they should look out, I mean, through that they clean their household premises, but to have some active surveillance in schools where children spend the, the, the most vital time, the biting uh, times, I mean, the mosquitoes, they generally are day biters, so they spend the child time in school. So it's equally important to look after, have some active surveillance for mosquito breeding places in schools as well. Um, over to you, Dr. Indira. Uh, thank you again, Dr. Indira. Very, very important. Simple measures, but could be life-saving. And, and again, uh, both of you have highlighted the need to have high alert about the, and the importance of the blood count. Uh, very important, very simple messages, but that would be very much essential and would save a life. There's one question may not be directly related uh, about the hand, foot and mouth disease. Uh, any inputs you would like to give? Uh, yes, uh, now I think these days, of course, we are not seeing much, but about a month back, we had a uh, epidemic, like epidemic, says there was an increased number of uh, cases and of hand, foot, mouth. So generally, uh, they present with fever. On day one, we will not see the classic signs uh, of hand, foot, mouth. So they will have high fever. And probably around day two, they will develop some blisters, mainly over the extensive aspects of, uh, I mean, the elbows and the knees. And uh, then later on, it might, it would spread to the palms and sores, but in all cases. So they would just come like macular papula and then uh, would turn out to be like small blisters. Even uh, uh, mistake it for chicken pox, but chicken pox, of course, is seen mainly on the trunk rather than the extremities. He is seen more in the extremities and then sometimes on the buttocks as well. That is not mentioned in classic literature, but in Sri Lanka, we had seen in children, it's sometimes seen in the buttocks as well. And then, of course, um, most of them would develop oral ulcers. And uh, so by around day two, their fever slow, slowly goes down. And uh, uh, because the few first few days, they are very irritable, ruling of saliva because of painful oral ulcers their intake would go down. So most of the times they could take only uh, liquids like maybe cool milk or something like that, water and uh, maybe yogurt or jelly or something like that, ice cream or even. Um, and then uh, some might even have a bit of a diarrhea because it's mainly due to coxsackie, I think, enteroviruses. And uh, so because of that, and then it spreads rapidly like wildfire to the other children as well if they're around the, below the age of around five to six years. Generally a very harmless disease. But rarely, they say very, very rarely it could cause encephalitis and myocarditis very rarely. But generally, it's managed as outpatients. Then again, if the fever continues for more than 48 hours, even though we find blisters and all that, just to be on the safe side, still we do a full blood count after 48 hours. And um, so generally, if the child is well and the oral take, intake is all right, generally you manage them as outpatients because if you keep them in the ward again, that he might spread the infection to so many others. So generally a harmless disease and seen mainly in preschoolers and uh, below five to six year old children. So uh, thank you again, Dr. Viraj, even though uh, that is not directly related to today's discussion. So today we have actually discussed a lot uh, of... Indika, uh, th there's another question. Probably Viraj's response will be more important than the, mine. Uh, the question is, what is the drug for patients who are allergic to paracetamol when treating dengue? Uh, there's yep. no alternative. Yep. <laughs> For adults, there's no alternative. I think the children, is, but uh, but in ch about children, I think the, the mother, parents are very worried. I, I think because of this possibility of getting fits with high fever and, and a lot of concerns are there. Uh, but uh, from, so we like can answer that part. But for adults, there's no alternative and it's not necessary. The high fever is not going to kill them. And uh, so just explain that to them. They can do tepid sponging and have uh, a fan uh, drawn and uh, keep good ventilation. And it's important to mention that uh, the high fever, other than causing discomfort, is not going to cause any any problems. Uh, what do you, Viraj? 
Yes, sir. So generally the same sort of advice we also give because there is no other alternative, but only issue is, as uh, you mentioned, sir, the February conversions. But then, then again, if you can't give more, so we had, I think, one or two patients doses. If I remember during my whole career, I had about one, I mean, uh, one or two patients like that who, who used to get, who used to come and get admitted in the first two days because of your conversions. They would get admitted rather than staying at home because they were worried about the conversion. But then again, there was nothing we could do apart from tepid sponging and reassuring the mother that uh, uh, this is a good immune response so that it will kill the viruses and uh, will rid your baby of infections and we'll be all right. But only problem with the the the, the febrile conversions and then hydration and tepid sponging were the, uh, the two things and reassurance of the parents that oh, oh, those are the only things that we could offer the mothers. Uh, thank you again, uh, Dr. Viraj. Uh, then there's one more question. Uh, yeah, we'll take this final question and conclude the session about the management of dengue during pregnancy. Maybe Dr. Ananda can provide. Uh, yeah, that of course, I think as I mentioned earlier also, if, it, if a pregnant mother gets dengue, that is considered as a high risk uh, in, uh, instance. And uh, one has to admit the patient uh, as early as possible, even on day one. Uh, we don't manage these patients on outpatient basis. Once, uh, depending on the patients, sometimes when they get admitted, we might decide to send them home for a day and review them next day. But that, of course, depends on the patient's condition, the education, other complications, and, and so on, and how far they are from the hospital, uh, and, and so on. But uh, for primary care physicians, admit them. This, uh, don't keep them at home. Uh, keep pregnant mothers with dengue at home. So, yeah, so that, that's the key advice. I mean, uh, don't take risk uh, pregnancy. You have to admit them. Thank you. So I think we have come out with a very useful discussion. We have covered uh, the possible causes for the current increase in number of cases and the possibilities and also the preventive measures, the red flags and the importance of the blood count and the risk groups. So very, uh, very useful, very fruitful discussion. Before we conclude, uh, uh, do you have any concluding remarks from both Ananda Vijay Vikram as well as Dr. Viraj? Uh, uh, yes, I think uh, because since we see increasing number of patients with fevers in the, in the present context, uh, we have to have a high, alert, high suspicion of uh, you know the we, we have explained the possible reasons the possible theologies and uh, then one has to consider those and uh, rather than taking a risk uh, whenever necessary uh, do a full blood count refer to a hospital when necessary uh, don't take basically don't take chances and also it is important not to use uh, NSAIDs because we still see these uh, using of these and, and steroids uh, just because uh, you prove that they are symptomatically uh, can cause relief, but they can cause severe, serious complications. So, so please don't use uh, those in a patient with fever in the, in the present context. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Anand and, and Dr. Viraj, your concluding remarks. Uh, yes, uh, so uh, basically, again, similarly, so no steroids and unnecessary antibiotics. Paracetamol uh, to look at the proper dose and give for children, please, uh, because uh, you know, paracetamol low dose can cause more harm than a viral fever. And then again, a very high alert for dengue. Don't forget that even though there are respiratory symptoms, diarrhea, whatever, and then uh, a full blood count on day two. And uh, please, if you send down the full blood count, trace it early. And uh, if the total count is below 150 or other indications for admissions are there, please uh, send the patient to the uh, to the hospital rather than trying to manage in the primary care because dengue is very dynamic and uh, very unpredictable. So some children might, you know, go the other way very soon. And because children, especially the they are they are they are what do you say the the reserves are also quite less. So sometimes they won't uh, withstand shock as long as an adult. So please be have a very high alert for dengue and as well as for the red flags. And if they are there, best thing is to advise them so that they'll be seen at a hospital and uh, done whatever is necessary. Uh, so thank you very much. What do you
Thank you again. Again, I think the message is very loud and very clear. Have a very high alert and don't take a risk and avoid the avoid using NSAIDs and steroids and also the imports of full blood count and the imports of the preventive measures. I think the messages are very loud and very clear, very simple, but could be life-saving. So I'm very sure that all the, the participants have gained a lot from this very important discussion in a very timely way. And uh, we'll be sharing this information and I request all the 247 volunteers and participants uh, to join the service and provide your service and also at the primary care level, provide your service based on the advisors and the knowledge that we have gained together today. And we'll be using the material for our CPD as well as for further learning as education material. And with that, I would like to thank uh, heartfelt gratitude to both resource persons, in spite of their very busy schedules, they have given a great service, explained very clearly and highlighted the important area. So thank you and thank you all the participants. And I'd like to hand over Dr. Sajit Ediri Singh, the Secretary of SLMA for conclusion. Over to you, Dr. Sajit. Thank you, Prof. Zendika. Uh, as SLMA, once again, I would like to thank uh, our eminent speakers, uh, Dr. Ananda Vijay Vikrama and Dr. Viraj. Thank you so much uh, for accepting our invitation and giving your knowledge and dis uh, for dissemination and uh, improve the knowledge among our 247 uh, volunteers as well as the other the doctors. So we, uh, this video will be available soon uh, at the SLMA YouTube channel. So you can share it and use it for your further references as well. So thank you once again for your kind listening. And we will come up with uh, these uh, type of common uh, topics uh, to educate uh, y'all uh, in near future also. Thank you so much. Good night.